Welcome, and thank you for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and I pray that this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. Found your place, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things, there is no law. Let us pray. Father God, we come to your house today. Lord, this is a place of joy because it's filled with lives that have true joy uh, found in your son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you will uh, continue to, to cultivate a spirit of joy as we worship uh, by coming under your word today. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit will be the, be the real preacher today. Speak through me. I pray this text be explained well. I pray that your son Jesus be glorified. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the great college football coach, I think I can say this, no matter who you're a fan of, Nick Saban. Nick Saban. I mean, the guy's he's one of the greatest coaches ever, if not the greatest. But he's known for giving a speech to his football players at the beginning of each season. And it's on the subject of happiness, the subject of happiness. And it goes like this, and I've, I've had to make it uh, PG, uh, or, or G, excuse me, because um, of Coach Saban's language. Um, but it goes like this. If you want to be happy for an hour, eat a steak. If you want to be happy for a day, go play golf. If you want to be happy for a week, go on a cruise if you want to be happy for a month, go buy a new car. But if you want to be happy in life, ask yourself this. If I didn't show up today, would anyone miss me? Get that right, and you got it. Now, Nick Saban, at the very end of that, uh, that speech, he's saying this. He, he's trying to cultivate a spirit of excellence on his football team, pretty much saying, if you didn't show up today, would anybody miss you? Because if you didn't show up, they would miss excellence. They would miss hard work. And that's what this speech was used for. And I totally agree that hard work can bring happiness in life. But that kind of happiness still doesn't last. That kind of happiness, the happiness of a football championship the happiness of any type of success, I will say this. I'll go back to that speech. It is just like the happiness of a steak. It's just like the happiness of a new car. It's just like the happiness of a cruise. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. Happiness relies on what happens. That's why we see those two words are so similar. Happy happens. Happiness depends on what happens. Happiness has a shelf life, but this is not the case for joy. Joy is different than happiness because joy is not based on outward circumstances, but joy is based on the unchanging goodness and grace of God. It is a, a sense of well-being that cannot be taken away in this life or eternity. So that's what we're going to be looking at today is this, this subject of joy and, and how it is different than just mere happiness. So as we're speaking on the subject of joy today, I want to begin with this. And I know this is a common theme throughout the fruit of the Spirit, but let's look at joy's source. Joy's source. Where does this type of joy come from? True joy can only come from Jesus Christ. 
Uh, this is why we sing that familiar song at Christmas. It's one of the few songs I can play on a piano because all the keys are right next to each other. Um, some of y'all are going to go try it today. But joy to the world, the Lord is come. We, we sing that at Christmas, but folks, that is the truth of Christmas. Joy has come into the world through Jesus. When we look at Jesus' first coming, I know we're going to be in the Christmas season very, very soon. I think something has changed in our world. As soon as uh, Halloween's over, we got Christmas trees up already. So I guess we're already in the season of Advent. So let's look at the Christmas story here and how it's marked by joy. Uh, When the wise men, when they found out about the star, about this star that represented the Messiah, it says, when they saw his star in the sky... They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Uh, When the unborn John the Baptist, you know the story, John the Baptist is in his mama's belly. He is six months older than the Lord Jesus, who is still in his mama's belly. And Jesus is only a few weeks old. I mean, you can look into the terminology of this. I think they believe uh, he's, he's at the stage called a zygote. And when Mary comes onto the scene and gives her greeting, it says in the Bible that uh, Elizabeth, the baby in her belly, jumped, leaped. Not just a kick, not just a jump, but we also have a reason for it. He leaped for joy. The unborn John the Baptist leaping for the unborn Jesus Christ. I think that's argument enough to let us know why the sanctity of life is so imperative and something to stand for. In Mary's song of praise, it says that her spirit rejoiced in God for her Savior. And when the angel visited the shepherds uh, the night, the day that Jesus was born, it said this, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is Born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. When Jesus came into the world, he brought joy. Jesus is joy. No Jesus, no joy. Jesus is the source of joy. Uh, And when Jesus comes into a person's life, he brings joy. I know this room is full of testimonies today that when you look at the day that you got saved, that was not a day marked by sadness. That was not a day marked by gloom. But that was a day marked by joy. Jesus brings joy into our life. The believer finds his joy and God, but he also finds his joy in, in God's eternal promises. A believer is joyful because he, I'm saying he, I'm just using the old school English referring to the male pronoun, okay? Uh, a believer is joyful because he has a relationship with Jesus. A believer is joyful because of his salvation. A believer is joyful because he understands that all of his sins have been forgiven. A believer is joyful because he knows that he is saved from eternal torment and eternal judgment in hell. A believer is joyful because he knows he has the eternal seal of the Holy Spirit living within him. A believer is joyful because he understands he has received Christ's perfect righteousness. You're not only just a a forgiven sinner, but you are a redeemed sinner. A justified sinner, giving perfect holiness. A believer is joyful because he is a child of God, a co-heir of Jesus Christ. A believer is joyful because he has abundant life in Christ. A believer is joyful because he has eternal life with Christ. We have a lot to be joyful for. Uh, This joy is also seen in heaven Not just on earth, but it's seen in heaven. I mean, if that's where joy comes from, then it has to be in heaven as well. But do you know that Scripture says this? When a person gets saved, when a person turns from their sin and comes to Christ, all of heaven rejoices. Think about that. Think about There could be a party in heaven today if somebody would come to Jesus today. There could be a party, a heaven full of rejoicing because of a sinner repenting. Luke chapter 15 verse 11 says, There's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, maybe you're like me. That's like a tradition of mine. I watch it when it airs on TV on Christmas Eve. And you know, there's, there's a classic line from that movie. It comes from George Bailey's uh, daughter, Zuzu. And she says this when she hears the, the bell ringing from the Christmas tree or wherever it was coming from. She says, look, Daddy, teacher says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. We know that line, right? That's synonymous with Christmas in America. But let me tell you, that, that line is not theologically correct. It is found nowhere in Scripture. Look up your concordance and try to find bells and wings. You're not going to find it. So let me tell you this, the next time you're sitting down with that hot cup of cocoa, whatever your tradition is on Christmas, and you hear Zuzu say, every time when a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, I want you to replace her comment with this. Every time a sinner comes to Jesus, all of the angels rejoice. Every time a person gets saved, all of the angels are filled with joy. True joy comes from knowing and trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is why joy is, is listed as a fruit. It's not something you produce, but it's something uh, that is produced by the Holy Spirit who lives within you once you come to salvation, once you were saved. It's a natural result of walking by the Spirit. The next truth we need to know about joy is this. Joy's security. Joy's security. Now, what am I talking about right there? Uh, what I'm talking about there is, is this, is that joy in a Christian life is permanent. It's permanent. It, it can't leave you. It can't. Now, some of y'all are like, goodness gracious, pastor, I think you're wrong because a lot of people just don't seem like they have joy in their life and they say they know Jesus. Well, that's between them and the Lord, okay? Uh, I hope uh, we'll, we'll answer that question in a little bit. But it'll never leave you. It can't be taken away. Once you receive it, you have this joy forever. Why is that? Uh, joy is not based on favorable circumstances, but it's based on God's promises and His eternal spiritual realities. This is why joy can be seen in the life of a believer, even when times are bad. Uh, James, the half-brother of our Lord, he says it like this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. What on earth? How, how is that possible? Because you will always have the joy of Christ. A believer can go through, uh, can experience the loss of a loved one, can experience uh, financial loss, can experience illness, you name it. The believer can experience all of those dreadful things, all the marks of suffering, suffering and still have joy living within them. Maybe you know this song. I'm not going to sing it. Maybe I'll have to to get the, all the words right. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Such a simple song that our kids learn. Maybe you learned that as a child. It's so truthful. That joy is down there, and it is there to stay. Why is that? Because you can't lose it. You can't lose your salvation. Jesus promised us, I will be with you always. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing, not even yourself. Nothing whatsoever. Our Lord Jesus promise, promises us to be with us always. Moreover, His word is never failing. We can trust in His goodness and rejoice no matter what our circumstances are. Speaking of another song, later in the service, we're going to sing uh, that hymn known as It Is Well. It Is Well, and uh, we sing that from time to time. I know many of you are familiar with this story, but I'm sharing it today for the soul that doesn't know the backstory of that song. But it was written uh, many years ago in the late 1800s by a man named Horatio Spafford. And this man, uh, he, the one that wrote those words, It Is Well, he had a life 
that was very familiar with suffering. He had five children, one son, four daughters. He lost his son to pneumonia in 1871. In that same year, he suffered financial loss through the great fire of Chicago. Then it's just two years later that Horatio's wife and daughters, they are out at sea on a ship, and there's a ship collision at sea. All four of his daughters perish. The man experienced the death of all of his children. He experienced financial ruin. Yet he is the same one that wrote the words of this song. And it is said that he actually wrote this song when he was en route to meet his wife after the dreadful events of that tragedy of losing him and his daughter. When peace like a river attended my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll. I mean, sorrow is just coming on them like waves. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It is well. It is well with my soul. This guy wasn't a liar. He wasn't just an optimist. But he could say it was well. Because he knew that true joy didn't come from life circumstances. But he knew that true joy came from Christ alone. That's why it is well. True joy cannot be taken away. A true joy is not dependent upon favorable circumstances. True joy last forever. So we know about joy's source. We also know of joy's security. Uh, I want to just share one final thing about joy today. Joy's stumbling block. Joy's stumbling block. Joy cannot be taken away. But it can be hindered. It can be hindered. Maybe uh, you've experienced this in your own life, but where you try to blame other people for stealing your joy. Uh, we call them robbers of joy. Uh, I, I'm familiar with this, this phrase. You're such a joy kill. You're such a joy kill. Sadly, the church is full of those two. Um, I, was, I was listening to David Jeremiah uh, preach a sermon, and I, I haven't experienced this yet, but he said that he would receive notes in the offering plate. And someone told him, Pastor, it's so cold in here, I can hang meat. <laughs> then another person in the same offering plate notes session said, Pastor, it's so hot in here, I was about to strip naked. And he says, well, what am I supposed to do with that? I, I can't please any one of those situations. And he, he referred to it as people robbing his joy. Now I'll say this, don't you put any notes in that offering plate. <laughs> I heard one pastor put it like this, all we want in that offering plate is your cold, hard cash. Okay? <laughs> but we think of people robbing our joy. We like to blame people of robbing our joy. I want to tell you this, the only thing that can rob you of your joy is your own sin, is your own personal sin. Maybe you have somebody in your life that, and you're just saying, Pastor, you have no idea this person is the definition of an antagonist. I, I just want to say this, the next time you feel that way, I want you to go and stand in front of a mirror and reflect on your life and reflect on the sin in your life. And you'll be reminded, no, that person isn't my antagonist. The person in the mirror is my antagonist. Because your own personal sin is what hinders your personal joy. While Jesus was known for his joy, he also has another name in Isaiah 53. A man of sorrows. He's a man of sorrows. Why is he called a man of sorrows? Because he bore our griefs and our sorrows on the cross. What is that sorrow? It's not just talking about our tears, but it's talking about what truly brings us sorrow. That's our sin. That's our sin. Our sin saddens God. Jesus was a man of sorrows because he took on our sin. We also see uh, the Holy Spirit is impacted by our sin. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, Our sin grieves the Holy Spirit. Grieves the Holy Spirit. Uh, in other, uh, another place in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, speaks of quenching the Holy Spirit. So I would say this, when you put those two together, uh, when, I bring, when I let sin reign in my life, it saddens the Spirit of God, but it also quenches the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of the God is the one that gives us the fruit of the Spirit, that means when I sin, I am quenching the fruit from being displayed in my life. Joy is evident when we're walking by the Spirit and keeping step with the Spirit. Walking and keeping in step with the Spirit refers to obedience. So I'll say this, when, when sin is running the show in your life, <laughs> when you're living in disobedience, that is when joy is being suppressed. That is when joy is being quenched. That is when joy is nowhere to be seen. It, you have this joy. It, it doesn't leave you. It can't be taken away, but it can be hindered by your sin. King David, he understood this truth in Psalm 51. After he finally came to the confessing his sin to the Lord, the sin involving Bathsheba, he said this in that prayer, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. David, I mean, he had been living in that sin. He had been keeping it to himself. He was dried up. He felt dead. He felt horrible. I mean, what joy wasn't anywhere to be seen. That's why when he finally came to confession, he could say this to God. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. David didn't lose his salvation. And I'll say this, he didn't lose his joy. But he lost joy being seen and felt in his life. That's why if we want joy to be displayed and be evident in our life, we have to take care of sin. We have to do what Scripture tells us to do with sin because sin is the true joy kill. Every time you choose sin over Jesus, just remind yourself that you're choosing the thing that kills joy. You're choosing the true joy kill. So if you want to have the fruit of joy, the fruit of the Spirit thriving in your life, you must do this. Confess and forsake your sin. Confess and forsake your sin. And listen to this. I know there's certain opportunities where this needs to take place, where you share this with a brother. You can confess your sin to God right now. You don't have to meet me in some weird closet and say... Let me. here's my sins. You don't have to do that. You can go to the throne room of God and confess your sins to Him directly. You confess your sins. That, that, that means you just say, Father, I have sinned against you. This is what I have done. I can't keep this covered. You know it. And I need your help to help me forsake it. So we not only confess our sins, but Forsaking is when we put legs to the confession. That's when we say, I'm not only done wrong, but I've got to turn away from this. I've got to do an about face. So if you feel that joy is lacking in your life, turn from your sins today and turn to Jesus. Confess your sins, ask Him for forgiveness, and forsake your sins. And can I say this? I know that sin is a sensitive subject. In fact, I, I don't know why it's this way. It's because we're just like Adam and Eve. We like to hide in the bushes. But whenever I talk about sin, nobody ever comes to this altar to pray. Newsflash. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We, if there's one thing we have in common in this room, is sin. Is sin. Here's some good news for you. This comes from 1 John chapter 1. This is for the folks that, that try to say, I'm not a sinner. I've got no sin in my life. I don't know what he's talking about. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Someone that has come to Christ is fully aware of who they are. And they are a sinner. But I like the very next verse. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to forgive us. Not just some, not just the petty sins, not just the acceptable sins. But he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. That sounds like a reason to rejoice. That sounds like a reason that, one, that's what I've got to do to get the joy back in my life if it's been suppressed. But I can have joy just hearing that truth. So this is what I want us to do today. I know this room is full of believers. If you're letting sin reign in your life, please turn from your sins. Confess your sins to the Lord. Remember, He is faithful and just to forgive you. And you can walk out of here today being filled with joy. If you're a lost person here today, and you're just saying, well, I don't know what he's talking about, about this joy. I told you the way to find that joy is through Jesus Christ. Today can be the day that you understand and you experience what true joy is. Today can be that day. And I'll say this, if that's the day for you, today is also a day that heaven is going to be partying because they are going to be rejoicing. The angels, all the residents of heaven will be filled with joy. So I close with these words. May we rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always. Let's pray.